Would I have done anything different? Well, it's hard to say in hindsight. Fuck that! Man, in hindsight, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the questionnaire. It still is. Forever will be. And I will always be the unknown factor, a.k.a. that way Wilson and hip-hop. Yeah, but again, man, we ain't on hip-hop. Even though this conversation before the show kind of went into hip-hop, which, like, is the second time it's happened on this show, which is... Which is bloody well confusing, but you know, I mean, I've come to the conclusion the more I bring on great creators, the more it kind of makes this circle fuller and fuller and fuller in just relation to how many dope people in the industry work with how many dope people in the industry, you know? And on that, we got Kalman and Roshovsky. Hi, and Roshovsky. It took me, I was like, I was like, yo, I'm about to butcher it. I'm about to butcher it. I am. I had to look down and then think about that. But I got it right, Calvin. How's it doing? I'm groovy. How are you? <sighs> Wishing some of y'all creators had easier freaking names. If I could go back in time, I would uh, I would do what Adrian Alfona did and just uh, use my middle name as my last name. Wait, what's your middle name? Abel. Okay, okay, okay. And everyone would be able to say it. I'm like my actual name. I, hey, man, you're not the first person who, like I said, I managed not to butcher your name. I'm not going to say it again, though, right? I'm, I'm really, really not. You're yeah, just. Go you're out just, on a high note. Quit yeah. Ahead. Yeah. You're Calvin. And that's that's what that's what you we're doing. With. Again, you can just dub in the, the time you said it correctly every time. People would be like, that was weird. What was that? He just opened his mouth and words came out, but the words didn't form quite properly with the lips. I don't want to edit that much. Calvin, stop trying to cause me more editing issues. It's 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 a lot of editing, man. So let's just get right into it though, man. Um you, good sir, have worked with a quite a few uh past guests that we've had on the show. Uh quite a few. I'm not even frankly sure how many. Um but as I was telling you before, you're making me kind of regret waiting for uh, Deadly Regenesis to come out in graphic novel form. Though I assure you, when it drops, I assure you and Erica both, I will be picking up that graphic novel. It's already on my pull list. Um, we thank you in advance. But but I, I really wish I'd have uh, pulled the... But, well, I mean, whatever. I, I mean, at least I can... You know, look at the cover work that you did. Because, like, dude, that last, that cover for issue five. That, that's, Thanks. I, dude, I didn't expect that. You know what I mean? And it's a great, it's a great depiction of, I think, how a fight with between them would really probably go as far as Kingpin and X-23. Y'all can see that right now, right here, right? Um, Actually, I have the original art just, uh, just beside me here. You want to take a look? Oh, yeah, man, I'll be honest, though, I was looking on your site, and yeah, I, I wish it wasn't as pricey. I'd, like, I'd love to add Oh, no, no, I'm this. just going to hold it up to the screen here. I know you, you're probably going to pop up the cover, but I, it's the only original uh, from this series that I still have. The rest are with my art rep in New York. But since it's sitting right here and we're talking about Ooh. it, I thought maybe I'd just hold it up to the screen for the people out there in, uh, you know. Yeah, Fisk. I've never drawn him before. It was fun. He looks a little like one of my brother-in-laws. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't watch. The, he'll never watch this, so he'll never know I said that. But okay, I was okay, inspired. Yeah, I was getting ready to say he might take that as an insult. Right, he'll never see that he is absolutely not a nerd. Although he is a great dude, he's nothing like Fisk in terms of uh, personality. But uh, yeah, slight resemblance. I Just, would hope uh, you don't know anybody with a personality like Wilson Fisk. Yeah, well, you know, I've been around. <laughs> I've encountered some monsters in my day, but uh, nobody I'm related to currently. So, good news there. It's always a plus when they're not in the family, man. But can I say, I mean, you've had a chance to draw a number of things and a number of characters looking throughout your career, man. You've done covers for the Fantastic Four. You've done covers for Conan. You've done covers for uh, the Sumerian is what it was called at the point when you were drawing it, but yeah, it was still, still Conan. Yeah, it's still it's still Conan. We're not gonna sit here and argue. I'm not I'm not splitting hairs, bro. 
you know, as well as everything you've just done with X-23. So you've gotten your hand on a number of characters. I'm just curious, man, on everything you've gotten to put pencil to paper to as far as character-wise. What well, one really just, you were like, ooh, yeah, really? I get to get paid to draw this? Every time I get to draw Wolverine, it's, it's yeah. a real thrill. And I've drawn him I've probably five or six times professionally, but weirdly, only once, like, from the front. There's a lot of, like, back view Wolverines or, like, just his arm or, like, for some reason, it just never works out that I really get to, like, draw, draw him, except for one X-23 cover, not uh, the current series, but uh, the, the the last series that I was cover artist on a, a while ago with, uh, written by Marjorie Liu. Um, and so that cover with Wolverine on it is still my favorite. Now, X-23 is also Wolverine, and, you know, she's part of the Wolverine tribe, and... Uh, you know, getting to getting asked to work on that the first time and the second time, uh, almost like 50, 60, 70 percent scratched the Wolverine itch. But I mean, being a, a child of the 80s, uh, you know, Wolverine, Wolverine, Logan Wolverine, like that's that's my guy. That's that's the mask that I doodle when I'm on the phone on hold. Like I could draw that. <laughs> I could draw that costume blindfolded. Um, and so the first time I wasn't the first time I got the drum was not also front view it was like a shoulder or something the first time i actually got to have a cover where he was like front and center that was a that was a, a tingly 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 fan moment for me well then i gotta ask your opinion because it's just recently been released via the, you know social medias what do you think finally seeing hugh jackman in a way more comic book accurate costume uh, fucking finally. <laughs> I've been waiting since 2001 for this. Give me that yellow. Uh, my only note is, uh, why are the arms not bare? I, well, um, what, wasn't it, um, because there's a costume where they're not from him. I'm most probably, Wolverine but, costumes are sleeveless. But most, yeah. It's yeah, the vast think, majority. Yeah, That's think a consistent... It. Thing, but in this one, he has these weird yellow sleeves, which is like fine. Other than that, it's perfectly fine. I can I, honestly, sleeves, no sleeves, doesn't really matter. But you know, if, if I were being consulted on uh, costuming, I would say uh, lose the sleeves. You know, other than that, it's fantastic. I bet there's probably either one or two or both reasons for that. One, it makes him look a little bit more similar to Deadpool in costume, with the full costume. Or two, Hugh Jackman's 54. Yeah, but have you seen shirtless and, pics of the guy? He doesn't I need mean, to hide anything. I haven't seen the recent ones, but is he as jacked as he was when he played Wolverine the first time? He's more jacked. There's a, there's a, there are these pics going around that show every, you know, dated based, based on every role. And, like, I mean, he was in good shape in the first X-Men movie. But oh, yeah. by the time the Wolverine came out, he was significantly bulkier. But is he now? That I don't know. I mean, See, know. that's what I'm saying. I mean, because I know that was something they got into with him coming back to this role. It was one of the things, like, I heard him say several times, like, man, getting in Wolverine shape isn't easy, which I would believe. Right? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a, a monstrous and never-ending ordeal of pain and denial. Um, the only the only other note that I have, though, which is not Hugh Jackman's fault, because he's he's a great Wolverine. Um, as this is a thing he cannot change. But uh, uh, my buddy, um, <clears throat> uh, drawing a blank right now, Rico Renzi. Uh, Colors Rico Renzi uh, did a beautiful fix of that uh, picture. He did a little Photoshop tweak of that shot of uh, of Deadpool and uh, Wolverine walking together, and uh, took it from a ninety nine to one hundred and fifty um, by simply okay, squashing so, back. So he's five foot three next to next to Deadpool, which is you know that's that's Wolverine. Everyone forgets he's five foot three. He's not short. He's like alarmingly short. I seen that photo not long before we started this. I think I might have been on Rico's page actually, or perhaps yeah. I was on yours. I'm not sure. Did you retweet that? I did. I did actually. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think I think I was looking at your Twitter, and I was like, 
I was like, look, they actually made it truly comic book accurate. So here's my argument. We just saw an Indiana Jones. I don't know. Have you seen the new Indiana Jones? I have not. Okay, this will probably come out in a while, right? So I can, not a big spoiler, but it is a thing that happens in the movie that maybe is shitty to say on opening weekend, but this is going to drop when? In two months, a month? Anyway, um, you can cut this out if, if it tweaks Hey, look, spoiler. look. How about this? For anybody, if you ain't seen it and you don't want it spoiled, jump ahead two minutes. Yeah, you can do cool, that. Good. Perfect. Perfect disclaimer. So, last warning. There's a significant flashback sequence where he's de-aged and he looks, you know, roughly the age he was in um, uh, Last Crusade. So, we know they can do that. And we know Rico Renzi in Photoshop can easily squash. So, why can't we have Hugh Jackman digitally shortened for the Deadpool movie? Because that would be everything I want from a live-action Wolverine. Why not? We can take 40 years off Harrison Ford. And if a guy at home can do it for one frame, professional teams of the hundreds of uh, digital artists they have could do it. We could have a five foot three Hugh Jackman Wolverine. And uh, why are they why are they holding out on us? Why are they not giving us this? This is the movie to do it with, too. Because if it's a little silly, it would work in a Deadpool movie. I'll tell you why they're not doing it. They fixed because, Sonic the Hedgehog because of um, fan outcry. There is still time. They could fix this Wolverine in the new Deadpool. Five foot three. Five foot three. I'm for that. I am so much for that, Calvin. I want to point out. I think it would be phenomenal. All right. But when you make him that short, he loses a lot of sex appeal to the ladies, in my opinion. There are a lot of ladies that would be like, I don't want Hugh Jackman that short. I want him as tall as he is. And that's. It never hurt Tom Cruise's sex appeal. He's five foot five. I'm sure he gets towers of puss. I think Wolverine would be fine just for one movie. There are five or six tall Wolverine movies. If we can just have one just for us, mates. they could do it. They could do it if the will was there. The means exist. All I'm saying. And you're right. If there's a film to do it in, it would be this one. Five foot three. Yeah. Two minutes. Yeah. Based on the fact that it's a Deadpool film, man. I just, more than anything, I just look forward to seeing them actually fight in film and it, and knowing that Ryan Reynolds is, is the one really pushing it forward with the story. Cause you can tell that, I think both of them have developed a sincere love for the character that they play in those two characters, you know? So I think, I think it'll be nice to see that really, really brought to life, but I'll tell you to bring it back to what you just worked on as far as deadly regenesis, what I would love to see in the Deadpool film is then bring the girl that played X 23 in Logan into it. Cause I'm pretty sure she'd be right about the proper age. To come yeah. in and, yeah, be real, real, real brutal about things, you know? And it would be a good way for Marvel <laughs> to be like, okay, here's your treat of Wolverine one last time. Then we're bringing in X-23. And then at a later point in time, they could recast Wolverine. Because, I'm sorry, I don't think Hugh Jackman can play that role that much longer. If he has another film in him. I'd be kind of amazed just based on everything he I, I said. I think he was done. This this is a surprise yeah. to everybody, you know. This is this is a victory lap or something. So yeah, I mean, I don't expect him to really do it again. No, this. it was Ryan. And yeah, there's a, there's a fan or somebody who every time they uh, repost something from uh, X23 comic, they they CC the actress Daphne something, and uh, so. Yeah, I've, I've seen her page. Uh, she is the right age now. We're very close to it. She's definitely not a child anymore. And she's not quite an adult yet, which is like that's the Laura Kinney sweet spot right there. So, Yeah, it's it's perfect. And it would there's so many things that they could help if they brought her in in that moment because it would be they could help introduce the X-Men. They would still have a Wolverine to play on in the X-Men films without having to beg Hugh Jackman to come back because... I, I don't think I don't think Ryan can get him to come back for another film. I think it'd have to be Kevin convincing him, and I don't know what it would take short of probably. I mean, a lot of money would probably work, you know. 
I mean, that's how they kept uh, Robert Downey Jr. around for so long. And it may be the fact that, oh, you know, you just got to play in the X-Men universe. Now you get to play in the Marvel universe with everybody. You know, so, I mean, there's a couple little aspects you could play on with him. But I doubt it. Yeah. So assuming that he is done, is there anyone you think would make a good Wolverine? Anyone else? Is there... Is there somebody who's popped up in the TV or movies that you're looking at that you think would be good? I think they shouldn't. I think they should do what I just what I just suggested. I think they would be better off to bring in X-23. At least let her have a five to ten year run as a character before they try to recast Wolverine. Because I think anybody that you bring in for that role is going to be so heavily compared to Hugh yeah, Jackman. Yeah. Then it'll, it'll yeah, just be a problem. Especially if he's just done something, it'd be way too soon, right? Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, I mean, you can't. Then how would you? How would you even explain an X twenty three without a Wolverine? Like, it almost. I mean, I guess I don't know. It's it's, it's hard. It's like how do you? Have, it's like doing Venom without Spider Man. I guess they did that too, but but kind of doesn't could, make but sense. You could, but you could bring her in in this film in Deadpool three, and have right. something happen to where this version of Wolverine dies. And, you know, X-23 is older and she witnesses it. And, you know, then you could start a whole revenge story for her in the MCU. Like, maybe the Kill time Bill authority. X-23. Yeah. <laughs> I, did you, would it not work? Yeah, I'd watch that. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I'd go watch that, man. That's, like, you just, okay. So, so it's Kill Bill, except this time she literally cannot die. And she has claws that just come out of her fist. And and her feet. Yeah, can I'll take that ticket. Everyone forgets that foot claw. Yeah, oh dude, that's That's so nasty. It's so it's so it's such a such a terrible thing, right? It really is. So uh let's flip this bill back, man, man. So everything you have drawn, like I said, you've drawn a lot of characters. You love that Wolverine. Is there a character that you haven't had a chance to draw professionally that you're like, I really want Pages on this character. Well, I mean, more X Men. I, uh, you know, I was cover artist on an X Men book, but it was like the fourth X Men book, so a lot of the heavy hitters did not appear, or if they did, it was weird versions of them. Um, there was one uh, Dazzler sort of backup story I did where the X Men were giving a press conference, and I got to draw everyone I wanted on the team standing in that one panel, but it was not a big panel. Um, So, you know, being an X-Men guy, I have been fortunate. I've gotten to draw Gambit, Wolverine, obviously lots of X-23s, some Nightcrawler stuff, lots of Dazzler. Um, But I love Cyclops, and that that press conference is the only time I've been able to draw Cyclops professionally, and that is, that was not my favorite Cyclops costume. I'm not going to say which it was, because I don't want to diss anybody but it wasn't terrible but not my favorite um so uh i would love to draw me some cyclops what do you think of the new cyclops costume they just debuted just debuted yeah i think like, well, they, how they, just? they i don't even think the comic is released if memory serves me properly at this point i haven't seen it then it's okay yeah the comic the hasn't actually was, released uh, about three years ago when uh, the krakoa stuff started which was sort of uh pepe laraz kind of doing a version of the Chris Pacello costume, um, which I liked. I like that one, but I haven't seen whatever new one you're talking about. I haven't seen. It's a little darker. Okay. I don't know how else to like it, it. It makes him look more villainous from what I've well, seen. I, I think we've already done that with Cyclops. Uh, okay. I'm going to quickly Google. It's not the crack Captain Krakoa costume. Right? Um, seen that no, 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 no. It's something that they're getting ready to bring uh, out with the uh, costume. My computer's slow, so just I love it. I love it when I make a guess the Google thing and just when I see it, we can talk about it. Well, then let's just switch up something entirely, right? So, so you didn't think any of the X Men movies did them justice? It's not, it's not that, yeah, that's. That's that's more accurate. It's not that I didn't like them. It just wasn't really X Men. It was kind of, kind of its own thing. It was kind of X Men stuff filtered through a Matrix filter. Like, 
<laughs> you know. What uh, X-Men film do you think pulled off the X-Men the best? Excluding... Uh, the second one, X2, uh, okay. was probably okay. the strongest one. I was that or say... First Class. Okay. Those, those, I think, were the most successful. Um, I didn't hate Days of Future Past, but it had some real problems. It was like kind of a, you know... Yeah, okay, okay so, sorry. The, the question that you're picking up there was like a comic book film that missed the mark. And so when I say the X-Men movies, I'm really talking about the first three. The next men first class was actually strangely fixed a lot of that. and was kind of more X-Men like without using any of the real, like the major X-Men and then future days of future past actually, in my opinion, kind of did a good job of like threading the needle of kind of like covering all of it. Now, I think First Class was a more successful film, was more consistent, worked worked across the board. Um, Days of Future Past had some really, really great things and then was kind of bumpy in other places, in my opinion. So I can't put it up there with the, my favorite of the series. But well, on the um, of Days of some of the Past, best moments were in that film, you know what I mean? Were, and that was probably the most X-Men. Because some of them that came after it kind of looked more X-Men, but then they were kind of dropping the ball in other departments. So I don't know. I think when I answered that question, I forgot there had been three more X-Men movies than the three I was thinking about. Fair enough. But on the days of, on the days of future past, man, I just got to say, and I don't remember, I think it was, it was either Sean or Greg that I had this conversation with. I think it was Sean, especially since, you know, he's just finished uh, Bishop War college. Um, They kind of, sorry, who who, who are we talking about? Who's Sean? Sean Damian Hill. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just did the uh, X-Men War College. He's the artist on it. Um, okay. hey, uh, they kind of punked Bishop. You know, in which movie? In Days of Future Past. Like, I know they were taking out people left and right and left and right, but Bishop always had way more of a survival instinct than most of the X-Men. I honestly don't even remember Bishop in that movie. I mean, I, I saw it in the theater seven years ago, eight years ago. So I don't, I don't barely remember. I must have been a, a, a brief, a brief like cameo where he just gets killed off, right? I, I mean, he was in it a couple different places, but he definitely wasn't a large character. He was in the future portion of it, where everything had already gone to hell. But the moment where the Sentinels break in. And they just start taking out everybody. They take out yeah. Sunfire, Bobby, and like, yeah, they take out Blink. I mean, they literally take out everyone that was there. Bishop kind of goes out fairly quick. And I think I agree. I mean, I think it was Sean. I'm honestly not positive. I've done a lot of quests over here. I hope you all are checking them out and enjoying them. Um, but the, he just, he always had a bit more of a survival instinct. Like I said, than the rest of the X-Men. And that's based on his entire character who he is and where he comes from and i just feel like he wouldn't have quite gone out the way he did you know mm. yeah but you don't even remember which shows that they certainly it must have been a, a very brief moment i do remember <laughs> blink though and I, I really like the way they handled her powers i've been playing a lot of portal the game and the way they used the dynamics of the portals was really cool and then they picked that up again in spider-verse with uh, the spot kind of doing that kind of thing like those uh, those choreography sequences with the portals really really clever really cool. I would yeah they did blink a great deal of justice in that film and I think it's odd in my opinion that they focus so much more on that character when as an X Man she's not nearly as prolific as Bishop is I mean Bishop has way more of a history with the X Men and has been way more of a main character within. Just the yeah, you gotta understand period. though, the movies tend to favor characters with interesting visual powers. So even though Blink barely did anything other than die in the comics, I mean, I guess they brought her back for that that other series. But like the fact that they could do that portal stuff made Blink made them choose Blink. Whereas like Bishop's, what are Bishop's powers? He has a gun and he can absorb energy and shoot it back, which is just more blasting lights. There's already five X Men that do that in various ways. It's just not. It's not, it doesn't add anything to the visuals, to the cinematic visuals, whereas you have a character who can fight with portals. Mm -hmm. That is a whole new flavor. You know? So but I think I that's feel probably like... why, despite the fact that Bishop has a lot more story stuff that they could be engaging with. Well, like. 
he also has the like the whole time travel thing, which they never got into. And That's as far powers, as though, he just got warped. Like true, not him doing. But it. but as far as the uh, energy distribution, I feel like there's something they missed out on there. Like why didn't they at any moment have it to where? Uh, oh, Cyclops is already dead in Days of Future Past. They had Aura, or that Storm that could channel power and. Was there somebody else in that? I mean, well, I don't know. Some fire technically could have hit him. Where, like, two people just hit him full blast and, like, charged him up to where he looked like a freaking Super Saiyan. You know what I mean? And then just yeah. blew three Sentinels all to hell. That was a moment you had that was possible that they never did. That they've done in the comics. Right. You know? No, maybe I just... I, maybe I just... And then I had... To, I told this to Sean, man. I've always loved... Him and Deadpool are my two favorite X-Men. And... I, I know. Deadpool? Yeah. Ah, okay. Them's, cool. yeah, yeah. them's my well, yeah, dudes, if, man. If that's, I, I, now I understand why it was <laughs> why you remembered him and I didn't. Like personally, never really cared for Bishop. Never, never really jumped out at me personally. Um, most people hate Cyclops, and he's a character I like. You know, everyone has their favorites. You know. Why do you think it is? Because I I've had several people answer for him to be their most hated character. I think I've had him as the monster Bishop. Huh? Cyclops or Bishop? Uh, Cyclops. Yeah. I don't yeah. think Bishop has ever been answered on either end. Um, but yeah, Cyclops has been people's most hated character on at least a couple of instances in the questionnaire, which you'll be able to check out a couple of the questionnaires over on the Patreon, which the links is in the description, just so y'all know. They're not probably all up yet because I'm catching up with my slow ass. Sorry, I'm just I'm trying to even get thumbnails on all these things. You know, I started all that way too late in the game, and now I'm playing catch up. Uh, plus, I still got to make sure episodes come out. But yeah, man, it's and I think most people say. Um, I know it was a past guest. I think it was Rich saying it was the fact that he was just kind of a military dick. Cyclops, military dick. I don't know. I guess sometimes. You know, it all <laughs> depends on who's writing them and what their take is, right? Like, there's there's a, a certain there are people who sometimes will excoriate a character like they're an actual person and be like, well, you know, he abandoned his wife and child in 1986 to run back to Gene. What an asshole. I can never, I can never like him. And I'm like, well, they needed the original X-Men back together. So writer made a decision to have him abruptly do that. And then 10 other people have written him since. And sure, that's not good, but it's not a person. You can't. It's not like you, you. It's not like you can really blame the fictional character. They're doing what the writer needs to create they, what they think is the most compelling story. So, like having this this grudge list tally chart of bad prior bad acts by a character always just strikes me as really weird because it's not a real person with autonomy. Um, but some people get really triggered in some storyline. Someone does something awful, and then forever that character is is uh, is dead to them. And I think Cyclops has certainly had a few of those, and people seem to be feel very betrayed by the things uh, writers have made him do. I mean, he certainly had some very asinine moments within the comic books, from the one you mentioned where he just leaves Madeline Pryor and Cable to, to I think he killed Xavier at one point, if memory serves me correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He sure did. <laughs> yeah, he just, he just straight up murdered Xavier at one point to... Um, doing the whole Phoenix Force thing where him and five of the X-Men had the Phoenix and they're just being assholes. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like he's got a bit of a list, though. I want to be real honest. Like, I mean... A bit of a what? A list as far as just moments yeah. where he was an ass. Right, but all that means is writers are continually using him <laughs> to accomplish things that require him to do bad things, but he's not a person. You can't hold that against him. He is, he is a fictional, he's an action figure that is being moved around. And the kids that pick him up decide he's going to stomp on other action figures. Not his fault. Especially in that Phoenix example. I mean, Jean Grey, Dark Phoenix annihilated a whole planet and everyone's still like, yeah, cool, that wasn't you. It's not your fault. It's the Phoenix Force. Then Cyclops, also possessed by the Phoenix Force, kills Xavier, and they're like, oh, he's the worst. It's like, well, why Why is one person get off and the other person is held to, held to that standard forever? 
I mean, that's a fair point as far as noting that it is. It's it's the writers that are playing with yeah. the toys, man. You apparently just hate everybody that has the uh, their first name as brother. I don't know what's up with that, man. That just seems really kind of harsh, you know? Like Sorry, what, what did I say? Like, you're like, what? if they're brother something, when I was a kid, I just didn't like them. What? What did I say? I didn't say that. You, what said, did I say? you said if they're brother something, you just typically, typically didn't like them. Brother Voodoo, Brother Power. Oh, That's... yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got a weird <laughs> weird hate on for characters that started with, uh, with the word brother. And I didn't even realize it until I was thinking back on like hokey characters that bothered me when I was a kid. Brother Voodoo is a great character. I love I love the way they took him into uh, Doctor Voodoo and becoming Sorcerer Supreme. And I honestly yeah. wish they had kept him there longer. I feel like they kind of knocked him out of that position way, way too fast. So I have no no issue with Brother Voodoo or Doctor Voodoo. I think he's a great character. Brother Power too. Mike Allred did some really cool stuff with him because he is kind of Madman 1.0. But uh, I don't know. As a kid looking through Who's Who's in Marvel Universe, I thought it was ridiculous that there was you know. Characters that started with Captain, sure, but brother, that's dumb. You know, six year old six year old Calvin did not uh, did not jive with that. I mean, fair enough, but, but nowadays, Although I like the Brothers Grimm, and I like Blood Brothers, so maybe not all the brothers, just Power and Voodoo. That <laughs> all right then, fair enough. But nowadays, you're sensibly. You think there are no bad characters, just bad stories. You really don't think within the entirety of the comic book industry there's not a character that was created that was just like, look, that was a bad character. That was literally just, it was a bad character. You don't think there are any characters like that? Probably, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to spend time like on negativity. I guess Fair enough. there have been bad characters that somebody else has picked up and, uh, you know, tweaked or reinterpreted and and done great things with. So any bad character is just potential for future reinvention. Even Condiment Man? Like, you really think they could do something with Condiment Man and make him just... The Condiment Man? Yeah, it's a Batman villain. That sounds awesome. I am so here for Condiment Man. You've never heard of Condiment So I, I've, I I've have gathered... Not from this you were not a dc guy you were a heavy marvel guy i was yeah i've tipped way more to marvel i mean i i did some i had some dc stuff i bought all the who's who's so yeah i mean there are some hokey characters in there right at the time in the 80s you had the marvel universe handbooks coming out you had the dc who's who handbooks coming out that those were my bible that was my church when either one of those came out that was time to draw it would just be like 32 pages of cool shots of characters and, costumes. and I could read up on all the comics that I missed that I thought I would never be able to find and some of them were characters I liked but a lot of them were new to me and that was inspiration for me to make up my own characters so that was that was my bible and that was my church and I still have so many of those characters and their secret identities memorized it's just burned in to the deepest lizard parts of my brain but I had Marvel <laughs> that had been around for about 25 years and you had DC that had been around for about 50 years. And there were some hokey-ass DC characters. Brother Power was really far from uh, the weirdest, uh, silliest stuff. So, sure, I mean, there's Kite Man and Calendar Man and the Jester and the Red Bee. And there's all these weird, you know, Shazam villains and stuff. Uh, I guess I said it for... Uh, I thought I set my alarm for 8.55 so that I wouldn't be late. But I was late because I must have set it for... <laughs> uh, so that just went off there apologies for that um you know but okay here's a perfect example of what i'm talking about kite man ridiculous uh, roughly on of, on par with condiment man but then tom king comes along and does amazing stuff with kite man so you never know condiment man could be the in the next dark knight returns level batman reboot in 10 years and some writer is going to make their name by doing something with condiment man you know Batman's trapped in a giant charcuterie board, and uh, the only one who can save him is Condiment Man. Bad pitch. I'm not a writer. I don't know. Uh, but, I don't even know. But I, I feel like that was actually that, that could actually that was actually a fairly good pitch. 
in all honesty, man. I don't know. I was more thinking like, you know, you just make it to where he's got condiments and each condiment has a different element as far as like, you know, one's fire, one's ice, one's one's explosive. One's Mandarin, but instead yeah. of 10 rings, it's like uh, squeeze bottles. <laughs> All right. So, so back to what you were saying earlier, though, as far as the who's who being your your Bibles, what what initially made you want to start drawing, man? And how long have you been drawing to the point where that's what you went to? Was it always was it always when you were drawing you were like comics? What made me draw? Well, the honest answer, my friend, I'll tell you, is divorce. Being a, a, a six-year-old latchkey kid, home alone, uh, you just got to pass the time somehow. And so drawing was the escape. It was uh, inexpensive. Uh, I could do it alone. I didn't need parental permission. I didn't need any expensive equipment. I didn't need to leave the house. So, you know, young Kalman is home alone in an empty house waiting for mom to get home from work. TV's on. We have cartoons at least until five o'clock. Um, and lots of paper, and uh, so drawing was was the thing to make that empty house less uh, scary and less lonely because I'm an only child. So uh, yeah, draw, 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 and then uh, then you got to make money somehow. And what makes more sense than that thing you do all the time anyway? To try what, and turn into the living. At what moment did you know that it was just something you were doing? To, uh, it was suddenly something you could make a living off of. Grade nine, new school, um, lots of moving around because, you know, single mom, I don't know. We were kind of building up the nest egg again. So uh, brand new neighborhood, new school, total don't know anybody. Grade nine, chubby nerd who likes to sit, on a, sit at home watching TV, drawing cartoons. Uh, got absolutely demolished in phys ed class. Got like beaten up got harassed, uh, you know, got called, a, I don't want to say the, the F word, the other F word, but uh, got called that all the time, had a terrible time. Uh, second semester, uh, a lot of the same kids were in art class, and everything changed when they saw what I could draw. Uh, suddenly, those people went from being hostile and malicious to, at worst, neutral, um, and, uh, and in some cases friends, because I demonstrated that I could do something right. Like there's a lot of, a lot of judgment. I'm not saying that like the way out of bullying is to, is to, I don't know, even people who don't necessarily have a talent should be, shouldn't be bullied. But in this case, I was not skilled in phys ed class and those same people observed me in a different environment where I actually had something to offer and it completely changed the dynamic um and that was a realization that stayed with me that there was something of value here that i could do something that was worth something so i think that was probably the moment that's awesome like that's 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 just that's awesome man in all sincerity that that through your talent you were able to just find something that, you know, made you not as socially awkward. Um, I don't know that I ever have. Uh, <laughs> Podcasting? You know, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, uh, well, well, it definitely wasn't the hip hop because I'm pretty sure I made more enemies in this area than I ever did friends doing it. I mean, when you got a dozen people wanting to jump you in a bar and this and that because, um, you know, I... I come to the conclusion, I think of memory serves me probably like, well, my, my son's autistic, and I came to that conclusion through that, that I was like, oh, shit, that's why everyone's always considered me so weird so much in my life, because I'm fucking autistic. It was just when I was growing up, it was never anything they looked for, and I don't have the 10 Gs to get properly diagnosed now, but, I mean, I've had doctors and his therapists and such, and he goes, yeah, you're fucking autistic, man. What's wrong with you, right? And I'm like, oh, fair enough. And I think it made it to where in making patterns and rhyme schemes and all of that, even though I started when I was 32, it was just something my brain got. And so I'm coming in at 32 and here are these cats that have been doing it for five or 10 years. And they're looking at me like, fuck you, man. You know? So no, I didn't make no friends there. 
Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm glad it didn't stop you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, pattern recognition is absolutely a, a neurodivergent superpower. So lean in and use it, man. Like, the sooner yeah. you know, the better. Knowing is half the battle in the case of uh, of, of neurodiversity. And uh, I was uh, I was forty. I was only a couple of years ago that I realized in my own case. Bro, in my I'd case so with autism, it's ADHD. Vibe. I'd so give you a high five right now if I could, but like, yeah, yeah look, for real, right? Back right? At you. Yeah, because it was it was only a few years ago that I realized. Like I said, my boy's only four, so it was it was in that whole process of going through all the therapies and reading up on it, and it was like, oh, well, shit. Yeah, yeah, these things really run in families, and that's kind of a barrier to getting diagnosed because you tend to compare yourself to the people in your family. And if they're also, you don't stand out as unusual. And, and then the people who would help you by getting diagnosed, look at you and go, it's nothing wrong with you. You know, everyone's like this because everyone, everyone sets themselves as the baseline of normal in their world. Right. So uh, that's, you know, that's, that's all legit for sure. Do you think that's helped you as far as being able to look at something and take it and then make it artistic and then even put your own spin on it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm I'm starting to understand all all, all these things that I just thought were normal um, are maybe unusual. Yeah, I mean, I have you know ten different things playing in my head at all times. There's there's popular music, there's video game music, there's, you know, scenes from movies, there's ideas for future things, there's things I want to tweak from past things. There's always, you know, all these things running all the time. And a lot of it is story ideas, ideas for art constantly. You know, I have, I have like story ideas that began, you know, roughly around that six-year-old uh, time that I'm still... Every couple of years I pull out, I revise, I think of new things, I fiddle around. Um, and there's always at least five of those on the go in my mind. There's always multiple notes apps and multiple idea streams. And some of that is just churn. Like I think not all of it has to be something, but who I am is those things are always going on. And the more I engage with them and the more I take a little time to capture them, what I really need to get better at is going back and refining and pushing them forward but that's more like labor that's a little too much like work that's the thing that neurodivergence is not good at that's where i maybe need a collaborator but regardless the periods in my life where i look through my my phone and there's just grocery lists and to-do lists and no creative note ideas are easy for me to flag as oh that i remember that that was a bad time but when i'm when it's a good time it's like i'm generating lots and lots and lots of content and ideas. Sorry, this is going to keep chirping every five minutes. Now. Why does it keep chirping, man? Why would, would you... Are you trying to see if you want to wrap it up? Did you get a... No, it's because I, I flick it away, and so it's like hitting snooze instead of turning your alarm off. So I would have to leave this screen to actually turn it off, so it might just beep every now and then. Well, son of a bitch. That's fine, man. If, if y'all ain't enjoying the conversation enough to put up with it, three second beep i'm really sorry because y'all can't see it in the whole editing it's just a beep i mean you already heard my dog barking because somebody's setting off fireworks at least i hope they are i hope they're not shooting guns but that's a whole nother point we're not going to get into you know i mean it's far enough away from the fourth i would think that it might have been, i i don't know i hope it was a firework all right we'll just leave it at that um but man i i totally agree with you as far as like how the mind works in that man and i think one of the greatest phrases i ever heard that i really i personally relate to is from sherlock holmes it's, it's look it's my mind palace and my mind palace has lots of rooms and all these rooms have different things going on all the time and i can't necessarily access everything in my mind palace in any given moment sometimes i have to be like hold on and walk through my own head and be like oh yeah that door contains that information you know what i mean uh that's from yeah the yeah, yeah totally yeah yeah. Awesome. So, I love it's, it. so it's, one of the things that I do is I've been trying to retroactively pull out what what characters of TV fiction, comics and movies are coded intentionally or not are actually coded ADHD or neurodivergent. Sherlock Holmes rates very high on that. He's probably both, but 
the fact that he's addicted to a stimulant um, and is obsessed with, with, you know, the negating injustice by getting the answer, the right answer. And he must know why, like, these are, these are huge classic neurodivergent sure. traits for both ADHD and autism. So, I mean, that's, that's, I think kind of an easy one, but that's one of many, like almost. <laughs> so every detective and almost every sitcom character is some version or if not both. All right. slowly building a list of uh, of avatars of ADHD in popular culture. I mean, there's sure. there's a lot as far as people that in some degree in, in fiction are neurodivergent. I think that has a lot to do more with anything than a lot of people that tend to be creative are neurodivergent. And in a lot of ways, we didn't catch on. that. Yeah, we didn't catch that early on. Like, look... Pretty sure Einstein it was probably neurodivergent. You know what I mean? That's why. Oh, that, that's well known. Yeah. Yes, he yeah. absolutely was. You know, so it's it's the and and that's what I think is funny about it is people want to cast some kind of stigmatism towards it. When if you look throughout history, most of the great creators and most of the great artists and such, they were on that right there, right? I mean, you telling me, um, ah. Uh, what Wazowski, the Waz, uh, the dude that worked for Steve Jobs. Wozniak, yeah. Wozniak, yeah. I don't know. I have never researched it, but if he's not and he still did all that, I'm kind of freaking amazed. Well, forget Wozniak. I mean, Jobs. Well. Hello. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But at least I mean, it's, it's my personal was, contention it, that if, if you are on, if you, successful or not, big time, small time, juggling side hustle or not, if your primary pursuits in life are creative, you've, you've got, you've got the whammy to some degree. If, if staying up all night to make that thing perfect makes more sense to you than a regular paycheck, a retirement plan, uh, you know, uh, investments, all that, you know, regular people stuff that, regular people don't understand everyone doesn't have and and us we're kind of confused by if like you know that's it's 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 there it's there if if freelance if you're our age and you're still freelancing and working gigs because the thrill of novelty is more compelling than the thought of working nine to five anywhere it feels like a cage uh and this the uncertainty is far more palatable than the sameness unto eternity yeah you probably got got the thing right Oh, uh, uh, you, you, you probably got the thing. I love how you said that, man. I really do. All right, because I, but I don't think it's a bad thing to have in any capacity. I think it'd be. I am in no way suggesting yeah. it's bad. All right, but it has strengths and weaknesses yeah. like anything. And, but and the weak. bad part is if you have it and you don't know, because then it's kind of like trying to climb the stairs without a foot, but you don't know you don't have a foot, so you're constantly falling down the stairs, and you're like, why can't I get up the stairs? If you know you don't have a foot, you can do things to help yourself get up the stairs. And it's funny uh, to take this back to what I what I do hip hop wise. That's why I think the unknown factor fit me so well because this was before I like I was given that name. Like I was given that name. I did not name. I would feel like an asshole had I named myself that. But then I wrote as a lyric, "You can call me an unknown factor," and someone was like, "Yeah, dude, that's your name." And I was like. That makes too much sense. And then I live up to it to the point where I'm like, this is fucking annoying. You know? Like, it's... It's a good it's, name. Yeah, but then I finally, like, learned that not that long ago, and I was like, oh. All of this yeah, makes... It's an unknown factor very, to the unknown factor. Yeah, it's like, ain't that a, ain't that a bitch? We kind of figured out what it is, but... You know, I'm still gonna run with that name, because I think there are a lot of people society-wise that will never understand that. And I think that would be a great thing is that if society as a whole would come to grips with that, man, I think it would propel us, um, you know, hopefully to Star Trek as opposed to the Star Wars future we're going with. I don't want the Star Wars future. I want a Star Trek future. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel you for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think part of that is um, being out. You know? you know, do you know who Dan Savage is? Oh, he's a rela relationship 
uh, advice columnist. He's had a had a column in papers going back to the nineties. Anyway, he has a podcast and a radio show. He gives relationship advice, and he's gay, and he talks about how the arc from absolute homophobia to you know gay marriage being legalized um, is was such a short arc. And he keeps saying, like, the reason is, is like people, people coming out is the answer. Like, how do people who are prejudiced realize that gay people are just people? If you don't encounter any gay people, anyone can, you can build up whatever anxieties in your head. And, you know, the whole bro culture emphasizes it. But if you actually re- learn that your uncle is gay or your best friend from high school is gay and you hang out with these people who are gay, then suddenly it it becomes not so stress inducing or whatever, like whatever it is. I don't know. I've never had an issue with gay people. So I'm trying to imagine what would make somebody feel that way. But the point is, is that he's always encouraging, uh, he gets, you know, questions from people who are gay and in the closet and they're afraid to come out. And he's always encouraging them, like come out and be out because the more people are out, the more people will learn that someone they love is gay. And that's, that's the answer to like things getting better for everybody because it stops being a boogeyman becomes a real human. And so I'm just bringing that back to like neurodivergence. Like I try to talk about it openly to people, even though some people might have weird ideas or judgments or whatever, because that that world you're talking about, that Star Trek future, like the more we share the reality of of what's going on and what it actually is versus, you know, how it was on a sitcom in 1994 and incorrectly depicted, the more we'll get to people sort of being more accepting and, and educated just by us, you know, being open. It can be scary, but I think it's, it's important for us to, us to just kind of talk about it and be real about it. No, dude, you made that point, I think, way better than you realized that you, that you did. I want to put it there. I mean, I mean so sincerely. Sure. I I little, because, no, no, no. Because, well, dude, like, I think that's just something that, you know, for people like us, we kind of do that, man. I know sometimes, like, like I'll fucking I'll loop this shit back and then I'm talking about something else and then something else and then suddenly I loop back to what we were initially talking about. I think that's kind of what makes me good at you know doing this here in my opinion because my brain just runs on 16 different levels at once. But as far as in regards to you know the more that you're exposed to something, the less you're going to be afraid of it. Like if somebody I mean that's something that they've done in therapy. Like if you're fucking terrified of spiders, all right, we're going to put you around spiders to the point where you're like, oh well, spiders aren't a fucking problem. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. It's, I mean, you're talking about it at a human aspect, and I'm talking about it as a purely psychological one, but it's the exact same thing as far as you know that's around you, so it's not something that is the fucking boogeyman. It's something that exists. You know? And that's... that's fuck, that's a great point, man. It is. And I, and I love the way that you did that. I do. Because it's... Oh my god, but now I gotta pick on you, right? Because why the hell didn't you have three wishes? I don't know. I just, I, I skipped that one so I could just, I was getting stuck on it. And sometimes you just got to, you know, good ADHD strategy. If the hard thing is blocking, you just do the next thing. At least you're doing something. So by the time I got to the end of the list, I was just like, send. So I kind of forgot. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, Look, I, I only ask because... Yeah. I've had several different answers to that question, obviously. You guys can go and hopefully look at the Patreon, and I've gotten up to the point where at least that question exists because the questionnaire has been modified over the 60, 70 times I've sent it out at this point. Um, But, I mean, I've had answers from everything from, you know, just youth eternal, letting your dog live as long as you, uh, you know. That's a good one. Yeah, I like well, that. yeah, I, I do like the, you know, let my dog live as long as me. I think that's one of my favorites, personally, to, you know, well – world world peace world health all the nice you know all the things that would just be nice cities if they were to happen um to to people being like look i've read enough movies and enough books i don't want none of that trickery like i'm gonna make these wishes and something's gonna bite me in the ass so i was just curious if that was your yeah, view of it like no it's a bit of that i mean it's such a it's such an old trope that like every clever sort of uh in you know every clever twist on it has already kind of been done like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna come up with some funny funny new take on this um but i don't know um i wish that uh we everyone in the world would have it instantly acquire 
an accurate understanding of what autism and ADHD are and what they are not. Um, and uh, that's a good start. Um, what else? I wish that I did not lose the Pixies demo tape I had uh, as a teenager that I thought was still in my box of tapes that I kept, but when I unpacked it last year, it was not in there. And I'm pretty sure uh, my former best friend, who's a bit of a sociopath, talked me into giving it to him when I was selling some shit for a move. And I only just realized that when I couldn't find it in the box, like 20 years after the fact. But I had a Pixies demo tape that I found in a used record store uh, in Boston when I was 15 at the height of my Pixies fandom. And it was like the crown jewel of my like collection. And somehow I, it, it's not with me anymore. And I'm still kicking myself over that one because it had... It had a bunch of songs that hadn't been released yet. It had a bunch of songs that came out on their next album. This is before Trump Lamond came out. And it had some versions of, uh, of songs that I still haven't heard out there. So I probably could have, you know, if I put that in the right hands, I probably could have made some money or I don't know, just a cool thing to have. Anyway, it's gone. It's gone, baby gone. And that is one that keeps me up at night still. So I would undo that. I would have that back in my hands. That's two wishes. I don't know. I'll, I'll ponder the third one and I'll try to give it to you before we uh, sign off. I mean, those are two fairly good ones, man. More than anything, the first one, I think I think it would be interesting that if that first wish was granted, the effects that it would have on us as an overall society and just understanding things. You know? I mean, that's that's intriguing. But can, can we, like, include, like, a limit of of you can only be in Washington for eight years. I don't give a fuck what you're there for. How about that? Uh, <laughs> That's not bad, actually. Yeah. No lifetime politicians. You all fuck this world up. That's literally, literally what you do. Oh my yeah, God. okay. Actually, I got it. I've said this before. So my wife gets mad when I say this. But I, I think this, is, this will be my wish. Anyone that could run and be elected for any position must demonstrate that they have the resume to do that job. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean only official education. You know, so for example, I, I teach college. I didn't go to college, but I have comparable professional experience. I'm an asset to the school, not because I went through higher education, but because I did a job for 25 years that I'm now teaching people how to do. So the, the main path is you become a higher education teacher by going to higher education, but comparable experience matters. So if you're applying to be a senator, a mayor, a comptroller, whatever position, in order to become a candidate, not elected, because election should still be by the people, but in order to run to be a candidate, you must demonstrate that you have the professional experience or just the experience to do the job. Now, that could be having done a similar job. That could be the education to do that job. That could just be other life skills and prior experience that adds up to, you know, 75% of the requirements. But you must demonstrate that once you have the job, you have some, uh, some ability to do it. Then it's an election. It's up to the people. But that, that's the thing. There's, there's way too many people who get elected into positions that they just have no ability to actually do the thing that they're attempting to do. So that's my wish. That's, that's my position. That may ruffle your feathers depending on your, your take on those things, but I feel like people should have... There should be some sort of baseline demonstration of can you do the thing. Have you ever read the book Adjustment Day? No. No, I have not. It's by the same gentleman that read uh, that wrote Fight Club. Oh, okay. Okay. I've read a few uh, Palinic books, but I've not heard of or read that one. I, I, well, I, 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 if that book was made unpopular based on what it contains, and like, I wouldn't be surprised. That's probably a book that they wouldn't want in high schools for a number of reasons. But I will highly. It's a high concept sort of what I was pitching. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> Uh-huh. No, it's what Does you it would have to, it's, wrong? it's what you would have to do to make that a concept because there's no way 
the current people in power right, would right. ever let that happen. Does so it involve the guillotines? So, mm, I mean, no, because you have to do it swifter than that. Mm, it's, 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 and then if you also listen to some of the music that I've made and know how much I agree with a lot of that concept based on the fact that you have a bunch of old rich fucks who don't want to give up power and they want to sit on their golden fucking toilets and shit and piss on everyone else. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a thing, but I do highly recommend the book adjustment day, but I'm not going to talk any more about it because God knows I'm probably on a list somewhere already that I don't want to fucking be on, right? But yeah, you know, what are you going to do, man? I mean, if, if you're openly honest, I think to a certain degree, you're going to end up on those lists unless you're in the elitist category, right? I'll tell you to that. What do you what do you think about everything going on within the entertainment industry right now, man? Because, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, from the WGA strike to the recent trend on Twitter of comics broke me. What's your opinion of those two things? Oh, I'm definitely on, on the side of the writers who are striking. Um, I think creative creative work is consistently undervalued. And uh, the people that tend to get the richest are the people that are not doing the bulk of the work because of how things are structured and accountants are lionized as some sort of fortune tellers and more and more decisions are made according to algorithm. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. The, the, you know, streaming has certainly changed the face of, of media and it is not the creators who are benefiting from those changes. That's a, that's, that's kind of there's loopholes as a result of that change where, Things are, funds are just not being diverted to the people who are doing the thing. And with the advent, the rise of AI, like that, that long-standing situation of creative work being undervalued is only going to get worse, not better. I mean, this is not a, a um, this is not a broadcast or a writing example, but, um, you know, when Norman Rockwell was painting paintings in the 30s, he was getting about $7,000 to paint the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And in the 30s and the 40s, you could buy a house outright with that money. Um, you could definitely buy a car. And then so oh. um, you could buy two cars. Um, and, you know, if you get the cover gig now for a GQ magazine or something comparable, you're getting about $7,000. Um, and it's almost 100 years later. So... The compensation for the kind of work we do is nobody's compensation has kept up with the rise of inflation. But when it comes to creative work, there's people are compelled to do it. This ties into neurodivergence, right? Like the, the people that do that kind of work are relatively guileless. We feel compelled. We want meaning more than we want uh, a good deal. And um, it's easy sometimes for uh, us to be <laughs> manipulated into bad situations. And then those comp compound over decades and generations. And I'm not saying, I'm not blaming the victim here, but that's a factor that is continually weaponized against us. So, um, you know, there's a show I love that doesn't, is not gonna have a final episode because of the strike. Literally, they've decided to air the last season with the second last episode being the last episode because the final episode was shut down by the strike. And I've been waiting the entire run of the show for some answers that I've, hoping I was going to get in a final episode that that will not air because it doesn't exist. That said, I'm still on the side of the strike. Like, take away all my favorite shit. This is important. Um, yeah, so that's an easy one, really. Um, as far as comics broke me, yeah, I mean, comics is a fucking grind. Um, again, it ties into the same things that, like, somebody who decides to get into hedge funds or insurance sales or... Uh, medical imaging or any solid, lucrative uh, lines of work that will ensure that they will have long, consistent income and a solid retirement, those people are not being motivated by the forces that motivate people like us who want an outlet to speak our truth, to make our voices heard, to share our inner worlds, 
Um, and we want to be engaged in projects that are meaningful and profound and beautiful and interesting. And how likely it is to make a million or not is secondary to does it matter? Does it feel real? These are these are the decisions we make. And comics is just like that too. They're consistently um, there are people who are driven to do this, and the people that are making decisions about how much gets paid to who and when are very aware of this and are are not not shy about using that to their advantage. That doesn't necessarily mean companies are unilaterally evil and creators are unilaterally wonderful, purely motivated people. I mean, people are people and there are complexities. And there are some great editors and companies and publishers and there are some dodgy creators. I'm not trying to like black and white it on that level. There are legit horror stories and almost anybody who has been working in the business for any length of time has run afoul of some something. Um, and had some uh, some kind of punch in the nuts or other, or several. The comics broke me thing feels... I haven't dived deep. Um, I'm not really on Twitter all the time, but it feels like the people that are amplifying that are not necessarily the people in comics. Those of us with scars don't seem to be the people that are screaming the loudest about the scars, just at a glance. It, it oh, feels very Twitter in that the people that are the angriest are not the people that are directly involved in the thing. That's oh, been well, my I know, I know I initially, Yeah, I initially had a past guest um, hit me up as far as, you know, trying to bring on to make more light of this. Um, and then I looked through, like, I just clicked and I started looking through everybody that hashtagged it. The thing that I found very surprising was there were a lot of past guests from the show who are all creators, you know, whether they're artists, editors, colorists, anchors, writers. I mean, they're all, everybody on this show, except one individual in the 60 plus 70, whatever I'm at now, episodes is in the comic industry and they make comics. You know what I mean? They, they all had issues. Sorry about that brief interruption. Use the opportunity to go and uh, get myself another beer. All right. Hey, that's cool, man. I ain't gonna lie. I used that opportunity to pour myself another drink, but we're back to the Cheers. show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And what I was saying is... Uh, Sorry, the main, before the main you go thing, on, I just want to say, um, oh. I don't want to make light of anybody's traumatizing, horrifying experience they had in this mm. industry or any creative industry. It's legit. I have scars. I know many people have scars. I honestly haven't done a deep dive. I'm, the impression I was giving was the, you know, the 30,000 foot view. But uh, yeah, I mean, comics is a, <laughs> can be a, a damaging industry for sure. So I'm, I'm sure everything being shared is, is legitimate. I personally haven't shared my stories on Twitter, but that doesn't mean I don't have them because I do. Well, and that's fair, and in all sincerity, in starting this show, especially with the show being as new as it is, um, my Twitter is mainly uh, comic book creators in some capacity. You know, we're just really getting to where we're starting to find the comic book fans. Like, I got to the comic book creators quicker than I did the fans of anything. I might suck at promo, like, really bad. I might suck at promo. I'm really good at, like, creating this and making sure the show gets up and all that and blah, 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 and conversations. But that promo part, yeah, that's the autism. You know, I just really, really suck at it, man. It's the, yeah, you know. It might be, like, just yeah. your time management, too, as far as, you know, I have to make sure the show actually exists. <laughs> Plus, you know, yep. kid and life and normal life and all that, right? But the main point I want to bring up is, uh, and like I said, we she was on the show recently, Heather Antos. You can check out her past uh, quest where we get deeper into this. A couple points she made. One of them being that when she was working at her time at Marvel, there were like people that would come in and do one issue, uh, just like as an artist or a writer, and they would get paid more than her yearly salary. You know, which I, I could see that as something that was just like, what? You know, because that's, I, I mean, to know, I mean, especially if you know anything of Heather's work, I. Highly recommend checking out a number of things Heather's done. I wasn't even aware of how much of her stuff I'd read. Yeah, Heather, and, and she's great too. 
You know what I mean? Catch her on an upcoming PanCon as well, where, the, where we'll be getting into comic or mythology in comic books uh, with four other creators. It's going to be an awesome show. I can't wait for that. Uh, I'm a fan of Heather and everything she does. Yeah, and, and she's just she's a really cool person. You know what I mean? But to even hear that from that and then other things that she went into, it's but it goes back to the fact of it's not even necessarily like I, I very much support what the WGA is doing. I very much support anybody that's had issues in comics. But yeah, have you ever worked for Amazon? Okay. It's it's across the board, it's in a problem where we have let the elite become too elite in what they do. Like you said, I mean, you're still getting that amount if you're doing a cover for GQ that's the same from back then. That's a problem, man. If you compare minimum wage from now to 20 years ago, it's it's a problem. You know what I mean? So there's So there's more of a societal problem in that than anything else. And I don't know personally, in my opinion, if we're going to be able to fix them one at a time, I think it's going to have to be a massive shift and make everyone understand, look, you want your fucking cheeseburger, right? You want your cheeseburger, then pay these people a living wage that work at McDonald's, you know, like period. And then you want your, you want your show, you want your show to be good and well-written, pay these people what they fucking deserve. Stop taking 90% of it, you asshole, right? And I don't know, I mean, like Jeffrey Bezos. Dude, there's no reason that asshole should be shooting himself to space in a rocket when half of his employees don't make livable wages. You know what I mean? Right. So, well, it, he's able to shoot himself into space with a rocket because his employees don't. That's, that's what I'm saying. So he at least shouldn't be breaking their backs and leaving them dead on a warehouse floor and telling the other employees, I mean, I know he didn't directly tell them, the managers at that particular warehouse said, work around the body. So not only are you letting somebody die in the warehouse, you're also literally giving other people that work their PTSD from having to work around a corpse that may have been a friend of theirs so they can keep their job, you know? And I mean, I know that's a hair bit more extreme on the side of things, but that's what I'm saying. It's systemically a problem across everywhere. That's something Heather and I got into on her past show. I don't know how you go about fixing that and getting it to a better deal, man. I don't. It, so it's you sad. gave me a Chuck Palahniuk recommendation. What was the title of that book again? Uh, Adjustment Day. Okay, I have, a, I have a recommendation for you based on what you're saying here. This is a book I haven't personally read yet, but I'm very familiar with the author and his other work, and I've been listening to him on a lot of podcast interviews talking about it. So I feel like I can still recommend it, even though I haven't read it yet, but I will. Uh, have you ever heard of Cory Doctorow? No. Okay. So he's a, he's a blogger and a tech writer and a sci-fi writer. Um, he's Canadian, but he lives in the States now. And he has a new book out called Choke Point Capitalism. I think you would get a lot out of it. A lot of the frustrations you're talking about, he engages with and paints the big picture and explains why it's more insidious and evil than you realize, how it's been building for much longer and how, and the things that, you know, we can ho hopefully do to kind of push back. So it's Dr. O, Corey Dr. O. Dr. O spelled like doctor with an O-W after it. Corey Dr. O. All right. That's written on the back of your questionnaire. <laughs> sure. Cool. Uh, that's literally where I put that. I'll definitely be checking that out, man. I really will. I'm not. Yeah, but I don't want to give each other more homework than we already have because I know you hate your deadlines and God knows it's hard enough to make sure this show is coming out as properly as it should be as far as, you know, I used, I started this and was like, I'll do one episode a week and now I'm dropping like three or four, you know, just... I enjoy the conversations that I've been able to have with creators because everybody I've talked to in the comic industry, there's there's a sincerity about you all. You know what I mean? Yep. I, I know what you're speaking of. Why and I, I, I find it when I yeah, when I meet people who do what I do, we we can kind of speak the same language. And it's it's most creatively motivated people have it to some degree too. And uh, I, I wish we didn't live in a world that so often tried to weaponize it against us. 
but among us in our own in our own you know in our own company it's it's the thing that enables us to connect and, uh, meaningfully so it's good why do you think that is that society wants to take that and extensively make it to where we're using it against one another because I know oh, I, didn't, I didn't quite mean it exactly like that. Oh well, no. Okay, um, maybe maybe I take it like that more because as a as someone that does music, as does hip hop, like that's very much a against one another thing. You know what I mean? Unless unless yeah, you know what? yeah unless yeah, you're a confined group. Was, yeah. um, that's not what I was trying to highlight, but that is certainly a, a true thing as well. I mean, I just think you know it's divide and conquer, really, right? Like that's. That that's that that's a trope. That's a that's a a thing that it's a term that everybody knows because that is a winning strategy in all conflict. And if your enemy is not unified against you, if they are fighting amongst themselves, they are far more easy to conquer. This is why everyone who has a problem with the system as it is really truly should read Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Like I'm a more homework. I'm a, I'm a more firm we just said We just said there was a... No, hey, 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 hey. I said everyone, hey, look, homework. look, look. Have you, you've not read that book? I have not. I'm, I know what... It's not, it's not like I've never heard of it. I know um, you've heard of I've it. I've not sat and read it cover to cover. I, okay, I, I did at a young age. I also have a nice little copy up here. You know, thumb through every once in a while. It's been a while, but... Yeah, I think it's an important book to understand because it makes you realize some of the tactics that are being used against us societally mm-hmm. to make us split up to where we are essentially conquering ourselves for them. I wasn't recommending that to you. I was recommending that for everybody out there, man. I mean, if you want to read it, more power to you. It is a great par- it is a great piece of literature, and there's a reason that generals still use it nowadays in modern warfare when it was mm-hmm. written as far back as it was. I couldn't even honestly remember... I mean, I want to say Edo era, something around that time. Uh, even though technically it's not Japanese, it's Chinese, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I had to check my brain on all that. You know, I had to step in my mind palace for a minute. Sometimes I get rooms confused. Leave me alone, Calman. Shit. Uh, <laughs> but no, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not trying to decide homework in any in any capacity, man. I mean, I know you've okay. got enough. Okay. Yeah, I know you've got enough. But, can you can you tell us what else you got? Oh, you know what? There is one other thing I wanted to get into that we have not at this moment, which is tech savvy, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you know tech savvy? Where where are you located? Your website, man. Yeah, but where, where are you located? Isn't you're American, I assume, right? Yeah, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so I just can't. I just oh yeah, oh yeah, dude, I. Dude, dude, I swear half the guests that have been on this show are from Canada, and I think it's funny. Heather pointed out it's like that's because you guys have free health care up there and grants for being able to do artistic things, whereas in America, it's shut up, go work your nine to five. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'd so love to see. You know. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I think could, it was Jim I could, who first yeah. pointed that out because people are always like, what is in the water up in Canada? There's so many creatives up there. So many comic artists are actually Canadian. What is going on? It's like this magical place. Half the artists I love are from there. What is it? And it's like, yeah, we have free health care. It's not being a creative is not risk on the same level. Look, it's, it's like it's just you can just do it and try it. And even if you're unsuccessful for a decade, uh, you're not risking your life. You're just risking how much ramen versus other foods you get to eat. I'm a nurse. I want to come there. I love ramen. There you go. My, my wife's nominating Canada. And technically, so am I at this point. Because um, I guarantee if I moved up to any spot in Canada where there was a good population, within 10 miles, I probably already know three people. Mm. Yeah. Like, seriously. I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not making that out of a jest. I know... Canada is a very large place, but I think at this point, half the guests on the show have been Canadian. Like, I could probably sit here and run you. Like, if I pulled out the list of guests and I just started running down them, you'd probably be like, shit, man, I literally have been at a convention with half of your guests. Uh, <laughs> no well, our, our population is its just generally the population <laughs> density is, about a, is a strip that runs along the border. It's pretty much where everyone lives. 
same to thought. Vancouver. I, I just got to figure out where. I'm pretty sure if I went to Vancouver, man, I know I know plenty of guys that are up in Vancouver. It's, it's really ridiculous. But I digress from my point, which was tech savvy, man. Y'all, tech savvy. y'all threw me off being like, where are you from? How do you know what that is? I try to research my guests, man. Like, no to you. I, yeah, I know I go sideways and off on tangents and this and that, but I do try to make sure, you know, I've seen and read work. Like I said, I seen what you were, you had that, had those original pieces uh, up for X23 for sale right now. And didn't you make me wish I had like three G's to throw at you? You got no idea. Cause that, yeah, whatever. We're not getting into that. Right. I live in America, so it's not that nice. Uh, <laughs> have your teeth done. Uh, yeah, whatever. Let's not get into that. Um, but Tech Savvy, man, I love your concept. Uh, was that something that was just handed to you as far as the entire script and you just got to draw it? Or was that a bit of a collaborative effort as far as? Uh, it was a studio project. So I, I work in a studio here in Toronto called Raid. Um it's a sort of a collective of mostly comics people, but other, other creatives too. Um, it's existed in some form for almost 20 years now. I've only, I've only been there for about seven, 16, 16 years, I think. Anyway, um, it's like a shared workspace. And uh, sometimes I work from home like today, but sometimes I work from that studio in periods in my life when I didn't have comfortable workspace at home, I pretty much lived at that studio. Um, so you probably know some of our famous members like Ramon Perez and Marcus Toe, Scott Hepburn. Uh, we've had lots of other people pass through over the years. Anyway, that was a studio project. So, you know, as individual uh, freelancers, we just kind of do our own work. But in the last few years, uh, we started kind of uh, hanging out a shingle as a studio for uh, creative services, bigger projects something that requires multiple artists or just a, you know, just something of bigger scope more than one person can handle. And the tech savvy thing was a studio project. So um, it was uh, tech savvy is a service provider for internet and cable in Canada. That's why I was like, how do you know what that is? Because it's very, very locally focused, you know, one of those things. It's not like, you know, you guys have like, I don't know, Verizon, I guess. Like, that's a big one. Tech I mean, Savvy is like a sure. boutique one. You must have some local Indiana competition for the big ones that offer like cheaper prices or more secure internet. So that's what Tech Savvy is. It's like a competitor to the entrenched giants. We have a couple here. It's Bell and Rogers in Canada. Um, and, and Tech Savvy is like the scrappy little guy who's like, we're not going to screw you over with mysterious fees, yada, yada, yada. Um, so they're, they've had this branding for a while now where they have these characters that are like, um, they're actors in costumes, but they're sort of tech user archetypes. And they, they've been doing ad campaigns with them over the last, you know, 10 years. And, uh, one of my studio mates played soccer with a guy who was a writer and he got hired at tech savvy as part of their like branding team. And he's a comic fan. And he pitched them this idea of putting out a comic book um, to kind of, it wasn't even, I mean, advertising for tech savvy, but the point of the book was um, there's been some dodgy business coming out with like giant. So again, this is more inside baseball Canadian stuff. This is why I'm like, really want to talk about this. So then we have something called the CRTC, which is kind of like government agency to manage media airwaves. And the big companies are, basically control everything the crtc and then they're very intertwined it's very suspect and so wait wait, wait, wait 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 all I, all I got to say is you think that's not relatable in america where walmart pays more in lobbyists than they do in taxes i don't want to know I'm, how many lobbyists at&t has at the fucking white house yeah. at any given fucking moment and in the congress like no dude it is totally relatable to a high level right. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, <laughs> I didn't think it's not relatable. Corruption, graft, backdoor deals, I don't think that's not relatable. Just, I guess, the specifics are, uh, are you know, the details differ. Um, anyway, there was a vote coming up, and they wanted to put out this comic, basically to say, like, you need to get involved in your electoral process, and you need to vote for candidates that are 
that are into looking into this and are into like keeping net neutrality and all these, you know, keeping church and state in quotes separate um, and that are, are going to investigate these things and not the parties that have let it happen uh, gleefully. So get involved. Otherwise, it could be a days of future fashion area where in 30 years the world will be unrecognizable because, you know, the, the telcos own everything and control your mind and control your phones. And so his pitch was it's days of, it was a whole thing was a takeoff on days of future past. Um, where there was like the dark future version of these like happy poppy sort of uh, corporate sort of characters that they were using to advertise that in the future they were like the lone sort of wasteland warriors fighting against this right. Hold on real quick. Evil reality. And then they were trying to go back in time to warn us now reading the comic that you need to pay attention. This vote is coming up. Make sure you do your part. And, uh, you know, vote out the people who let this corruption happen. Not naming parties, but, like, this is how we change the future by acting now. So that was the pitch of the comic. And the whole thing was kind of a riff on Days of Future Past. And so we had a lot of fun, like, actually pastiching. Hey, real of, quick, real quick, real quick, real quick, man. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Quick, quick at it. Hey, look at that, right? So we start talking about all these telecommunication companies. Suddenly, there you go. What's up with that? You think, men, are they spying? Yeah, even though I did a comic uh, f supporting uh, and advertising tech savvy, I, 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 I subscribe to a different tel telco that is one of the big evil ones. So maybe this is a sign that I need to switch because they've already cut us off twice and it probably won't be the last time. So You're like, look, look, no more of you talking your evil, evil shit. Let us just be evil. Sorry, I just tickled my funny bone a little, a little too much, especially the timing of that man. But you were like you were saying, as far as there's a lot of similarities between that story and the days of future past, and I do definitely see that man. And also, <laughs> even though you're bringing up companies that I personally wasn't familiar with because I'm a U.S. citizen, I, I think it's a story that resonates. I mean, a lot of places, you know, even if you don't have to know the specifics of it. I mean, you know, it can just be, okay, well, there's this small corporation and then there's this big evil corporation. I don't need to know that those are specific corporations because in all sincerity, in reading that, um, I thought you guys made those companies up. I wasn't aware they were real companies. That makes it even funnier that they're real companies, by the way. Well, and, the, the evil company in the comic is not a real company, obviously. Aww. It couldn't use their actual name when calling them evil. I mean, that's... Uh, that's uh, actionable. So uh, we did make those companies up, but anybody reading would know uh, what we're actually talking about if they were in, in this area and were familiar with the corporate situation here. I mean, fair enough. And I highly recommend you guys go check that comic out. Like I said, you can go read issue one for free. It's in the links in the description right on his website. Just click it. You can find that link right there. To where you can go read it. I think it's very, very relatable regardless of where you are because corporation, or I mean, uh, corruption in corporations, uh, that's just humanity, unfortunately. I don't think it's localized to anywhere on this planet. I don't think... Definitely it's... not just a Canadian problem. Yeah, no. I I mean, if, if uh, Vlad from Serbia and some of the crap and just... just We've had guys from, from all over, man, as far as on the show, and there's it's corruption abounds, you know what I mean? It's not, sadly, it's not a small problem whatsoever. So I'm curious then, in that though, right? Came, came, uh, Calvin, fuck, sorry, fucking up your name, bro. How am I going to fuck up your first name, though, and not the last one? That's a different note altogether, right? Calvin, uh, what do you prefer working on? As far as artistically, do you like it when you get a chance to work on small stories like that, where it's something that's a bit more personal, or do you prefer, you know, working for one of the big two and getting, you know, that chance to draw those characters that are just <clears throat> have a legacy behind them? I definitely, I mean, I, I enjoy it all, um, you know, but I prefer 
I can design the characters that I'm drawing, that is that is vastly preferable to me. Character design is is the cookie. It's, you know, all, all creative endeavors are part part play and part grueling ordeal. And uh, it's a question of what the ratio is, right? Like you want to do things that have as much joy as possible. And I think it's it's our responsibility as creators to keep keep the work as joyful as possible. It's really easy. Uh, you know, comics broke me type of pathway to get into cycle of bitterness and misery and burnout. Um, but all we really have to sell is joy. Really? Like, and it's so much better for us. It makes existence so much better when it's joyful. But there's some ineffable quality that when you're drawing or writing or whatever, if it is joyful, it doesn't matter how technically correct or accomplished it is. I mean, in broad categories, it does, but it doesn't matter that much because if it's joyful, that will kind of ring out and capture attention in a way that is impossible to really quantify. So I think we have a responsibility as creators to understand what brings us joy and, and try to pursue that as much as possible. And for me, one of the things that is joyful is getting to design characters and design costumes. And the, the cookies to, uh, to ordeal ratio of character design is very positive. It's like 90-10, whereas almost all other art endeavors are 50-50 at best. <laughs> so generally, um, I like things that I get to design. So sometimes... Occasionally, when I do Bake Two work, that's a possibility. Occasionally, also, of course, like getting to draw the characters that you loved. Like, yeah, personally for me, it's X Men, it's mutants, it's Wolverine. But not everything is going to be that. Um, or, yeah, hey, hey, Kelman, we want you to do this Wolverine cover. Awesome. Actually, this month he's a cyborg gargoyle because Mephisto cast a spell. So, you know, you have to draw this other thing. It's not really Wolverine. So there's a lot of that. Oh, this month it's this crossover. So now he's a he's a Nazi robot. Okay. <laughs> um, or do do a Horseman of Apocalypse Wolverine, or do a Gwenpool Wolverine. Okay, sure. So it's not always going to be the way you want. So obviously it is a massive thrill to do that. Um, getting anointed by the powers that be by the big two was a massive threshold crossed for me in terms of my career, my professional career, my sense of what I was doing, uh, validation and all that. And I love working for them and I want to keep working for them. But when I have a creative hand in what I'm doing, which is far more common in smaller things like Captain Canuck or Tech Savvy or, you know, God willing, you know, some of my own stuff, if I can get my discipline side together to make that happen, um, that's the stuff that I'm the most excited about. Doesn't mean I'd say no to big two. <laughs> but that's that's really what I'm here for. Really what I'm here for is to work on stuff that I have had a more of a creative hand in or that I have completely created. So always, always into more of that if possible. All I know, Calvin, you just put so many different thoughts in my head as far as like part of me wants to have a conversation with you after the show about something. Part of me wants to be like, hey, man, so I got this other thing coming up here soon that I ain't quite got a date schedule for that I got two really dope artists booked for that I need three more I booked for before I currently lock in a date and hey what's up you want to come draw live on the show here soon yeah yeah sure we can do that I do live draw sometimes it's I can a, do one for you I, well, well I promise you uh, when we do live drawings we do very intriguing algamations more than anything else that's what the last two were the first was uh, aliens uh, you know when a face hugger got on something that was very very unique maybe it was cat dog maybe it was ariel maybe it was uh maybe it was a uh, rainbow dash from my little pony you know maybe it was uh you know just things like that or or you know some modern heroes done up in D D style that episode you should be able to check out now i, I know you can check out the algamating aliens <laughs> um and then i gotta come up with what we're gonna mesh together for this to make it really screwy so we'll definitely you know give you that character design tick as far as like maybe even taking a classic character, but then putting some kind of interesting twist on it 
you know, it's just, we're going to have to figure out what I, I, I've got an idea or two for what we're going to do, but yeah, I haven't quite nailed that in. I got to talk to Dave over, helps me do uh, this month in comics. He usually helps me nail down what we're going to do as far as regards to that. Right. Um, but in on that, man, I got to say, it's been a joy with you and with everybody else that I've quested with, man, this is, it's just been a sheer pleasure all the conversations that we've had, everywhere they've gone on so many different levels. Sometimes we're talking comics. Sometimes we're talking top politics. Sometimes we're talking just general mental health issues, man. And I think it's all important that those conversations are had within our society more. Sorry that it, I'm the madman leading it, y'all. But that's just what I decided to do, I guess. And everybody's been cool with it so far. So we're going to keep doing it over here. Right? But, again... I want to do do me a favor. Make sure you all click all the links in the descriptions. Check out Coleman's work, right? He is, check out that comic, right? It's right there. You can read the first issue for free. You can check out his art. You can check out, you can buy some original art from the man. Go buy up one of the X23 covers and get rid of them so I can stop tempting me to get it, right? But on that note, I do want to, I do want to say that if you have enjoyed this quest, right, with Calvin, right, what I want you to do is, Send any mythical creature that has lion parts. Damn, bro, you were vague as fuck with that answer. Like, Jesus Christ. Most people get a little more specific. But so, so any mythical creature that has lion parts, pick one. There's plenty, right? Just bringing him a bunch of Shogun warriors, right? And apparently any kind of food, right? Bring him something really weird, like... Some monkey brains or eyeballs or just 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 bring them something really weird. These are the things that I would usually send people when they didn't like the interview. I want to point out are the things you're gonna send to Calman. But you know what are you gonna do now? If you didn't like the interview, dude, I don't even want to send that one after you. That's just really mean. I don't like. I've never I've never looked at something and been like. Like, I don't want to send that after him. But the aliens from They Live? Like. Like. Dude, that's so mean. That's so mean. But I guess, I mean, get some of them aliens from They Live, right? And, you know. I guess make them smell like Rosemary and send them his way. So, really what I want you to do is, like. I guess just get some politicians that have been in politics for like 20 years, smother them in rosemary, and then send them to Calvin. He'll have a blast. Huh? Huh? Yeah. But beyond that, like I said, shit. I lost my thumb. Don't you hate it when you lose your thumb? Yeah, it's not a good time. I... I lost my thumb. But for all y'all out there, do me a favor. Like, subscribe, give it that thumbs up, comment, do all that goodness, right? Check out all the links in the description. Get your comic on. And have a good night, y'all.